This is Larry Bond, and you're listening to Break It Down. And now, the Break It Down Show with John and Pete. With us today on the Break It Down Show, we have the pleasure of a conversation with author and video game designer. There's a combination of stuff. Man. Larry Bond. So, Larry, we were talking about social media and what a novel concept it is to post things on social media when you actually have something to say that's of some consequence. <laughs> yeah, instead of just banging your own drum over and over that's, again. You're kind of a maverick that way. Well, it's it's I have to look at what I'm doing on social media. I'm, I love Facebook. And my wife is always on me about it because I, yes, I will go on and look at pictures of cute cats, but all cats start to look the same after a while. And when people come to my site, I want them to say, hey, let's see if Larry Bond has anything new up. And I want it to be things that they're interested about, which are things that I'm interested about, which are history, naval technology, war gaming, um, it's it's I don't want to use the word niche, but there are there are people who are interested in the same things that I am, and I, I post stuff that I think they will care about. So uh, I don't think they're interested on photos of me and my uh, Disney World vacation or when we when we go to the beach. I mean, so there are authors who do that, and if it works for them, that's fine. Just not your style, though, huh? Well, it's it's I think people draw the line between authors as people. And they like to think that they like to know that we're people. It's it's funny when I meet somebody, and oh, you're an author. Oh, I read your stuff, and and the relationship will transition just a little bit. But I like that because they I've I've communicated with them through my stories before they've ever, ever had a chance to meet me. So they know a little bit about me. They know what kind of stuff I I write, and they must have liked it because they kept reading it. And yeah. then to some degree, they stay out of your personal business. To some degree. To some degree. I think at that point, the the relationship becomes between them and the work more than them and you. And I imagine when you get cornered, you get cornered and, and you talk about stuff that you've done, stuff that you've written, things that they've consumed that are your product. Whereas if you were, let's say, I don't know, what what other, maybe a rock star. If you're a rock star... Then they just want to talk about you. Hey, man, what are you doing on Maui? And and where where can we hang? Let's hang out and let's have some margaritas and get some shrimp. Let's be friends. You know, yeah. I, will, I will confess to being a, a, a celebrity hound as much as anybody else. I have my favorite celebrities. <laughs> I like to who, go to autographs and get, get autographs. Who, who's on that list, Larry? I got to know. Uh, okay. Other authors, uh, Larry Niven, Terry Pratchett. We got a chance to meet Terry Pratchett quite a few years ago. Uh-huh. And my girls were huge Discworld fans. And I thought it was real thrill meeting Terry Pratchett. Um, some movie stars, uh, one of my, my best autographing experiences was at Origins, which is a convention that's held out in the Midwest every summer. And they used to wheel in some fairly major celebrities. And the the big the big guy that year was Anthony Daniels. No kidding. C-3PO. Yeah. Now, I go up to the booth. There's a... When I'd been to Origins often enough, so I knew the layout of the place. And there was a, a stage that the the people would sign at. And that's where they put the list of when they'd be appearing, what times. So I went there to, to find out when Anthony Daniels would be appearing. And lo and behold, there he was. And there were like three people in line. Wow. Ooh, I'm in line. And I still had to wait 20 minutes because he was chatting with everyone. He was just, there was no no pressure because there was no long line. So he was, you know, just chatting with everybody. Heck of a nice guy. Not terribly large. Of course, he had to fit inside that suit. But I, I really felt like I had a chance to engage with a, a, a person that I would really enjoyed his work, and I complimented him on his work. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you think about there actually is a dude in that suit, and uh, his acting is so good. I don't even ever consider that. Like he actually can pop and lock. <laughs> he's he's a ro- he's, he's a, a robot. robot. Yeah, he's yeah. a robot. Totally. Well, the thing with Anthony Daniels is he gets the be- the benefit of anonymity, while also having been in the biggest movie of all time. 
Oh, it's huge. It's so, huge. So and there you are with in line with three three other people to see Anthony Daniels because nobody can look in from the lobby and go, oh, there's C three PO and notice that there's C three PO. It's just some dude and he's standing there and he's and he's engaged with everybody and he's talking and telling stories. Well, it's it's he's almost a voice actor. And I have to wonder, I hope he's in good health because now they got more Star Wars movies coming. Yeah. And if C three PO isn't in those movies, there's gonna be hell to pay. That's right. My yeah, he's going to have a lot of work to do. I once met, I was at, what, doggone it, what was it? I was at the Star Trek convention in Las Vegas, and I'm not a big trekker, but I found myself in the employ of a company that hired me to kind of be a spokesperson, and they were the sponsor of the event, so I got to show up, and I I got to meet all kinds of people that I never expected to meet. One of them was the guy who played the robot in Lost in Space. Wow. Oh, my gosh. And no yeah, and that was really neat, except that I have to say the guy said he was standing outside smoking a cigarette. So I went outside and I talked to him. He's an older gentleman. I always like to talk to the guys who've been in, you know, been around, been in the business for a long time. And I found him really interesting. So I went out and I was talking to him and he said, yeah, listen, I was on this cruise ship. Right. And I was on there with a bunch of other celebrities and he started naming these names. I had no idea who these people were. And they were like, oh, yeah, he was the guy <laughs> who played the creature from the Black Lagoon and and so and so who was the Loch Ness monster in the. And I was like, who? This was a cruise ship full of celebrities. Nobody knows who any of these people are, but they all fit in that Anthony's Daniels category. Unless you're a fan of those horror movies with budgets in the dozens of dollars. It, yes, I would, I would. I would. <laughs> pay to go on a cruise like that that sure. sounds like heck of a lot of fun yeah i'm the guy that I mean, wore the swamp yeah, thing it, it's sometimes it's the corner characters that can give you the biggest thrill now you're not a big trek name person so you won't know william winden i won't you're right mm-hmm. okay william winden's a character actor he, he's played in dozens of things but he is most famous for the star trek fans for playing commodore matt decker in the Doomsday Machine, which was the one where, in the original series, the Enterprise was fighting this planet eater. And William Wyndon played the Commodore that had lost to the planet eater. And they show this shattered starship. And Decker played this guy who was absolutely shattered himself. He was completely destroyed. His crew had been killed, and, and he felt it was his responsibility and throughout the, I mean, the, the the portrayal of the character made him immortal. And and I got a chance to talk with him at another Star Trek convention I went to about um, his how he was directed, how he uh, got where where he found the motivation to do all this good stuff, and uh, plus I got his autograph. And then he passed away a few years later, so mm. you know. But, wow. Uh, Talking with those guys and hearing, for instance, Molokai Throne, Throne, another character actor, was also at the convention. He was a huge, uh, he was a huge uh, science fiction fan, and got onto the show because he was close friends with Gene Roddenberry. Wow! And and so we got to talk about his interest in science fiction, and uh, so you know, actors they're putting out that stuff to people who enjoy their work. And I, I take a little bit of that same kind of thing. I do it through my words to other people and they enjoy it. And people will come up to me and say, I really like this character or I really liked the way you showed this happening. And so that's what I try to take away from that. Well, that's kind of neat that you mentioned William Wyndham. I just looked him up. So he uh, actually died in Woodacre, which is not too far from where we are. Uh. And uh, he died in 2012. But he also was in two episodes of The Twilight Zone. Really? Which ones? He was, let's see. He portrayed Glenn Morley, a fictional congressman from Minnesota. And Oh, no, wait a minute. That was in The Farmer's Daughter with Inger Stevens. You know what? It doesn't list the uh, the two episodes of the Twilight Zone that he was in, and that's a shame. Uh, and uh, that'd be worth looking up. But we're talking about a guy who was in both Star Trek and the Twilight Zone. Yeah. So really, he's immortalized himself two different ways. Well, there's 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 so many name 
stars that ended up in the Twilight Zone. Robert Redford was in an episode of the Twilight Zone. No kidding. I mean, it's it's a it's a wonderful episode. It's about an old woman who's who's living in a basement apartment, and she's uh, afraid to go outside. She gets all her food delivered to her and everything because they want to tear down her apartment, and the the the, the management's after her to to sell. But in addition, she's she's just a recluse, and Robert Redford plays death, and he's the hero. Wow, <laughs> he has, he's an extremely young Robert Redford, of course, but he um, through through a uh, a subterfuge he gets into her apartment. He sees a policeman who's been hurt. She brings him in, and his wounds go away. And they talk for a while, and she he says, "Take my hand." And she dies, and and all of a sudden, you know, all her worries and everything go away, and I mean, because she's simply living in fear. And she dies but, holding uh, hands yeah, with Robert Redford. How bad is that? <laughs> and uh, so many other name authors. I, I really enjoy watching that show. I'm you know I'm a big fan of of the fir- the original Twilight Zone. Uh, so many of those classic science fiction shows talked about things you couldn't talk about on TV back then. That's true. Yeah, a lot of the science fiction shows, and and I want to talk about how that ties into your work, but a lot of the science fiction shows got away with hiding issues, social issues, in other guises, because you could talk about racism, except it was humans and aliens. Right. Yeah. And they would put the same sort of subtext on things, so you could really examine the issue without having to say, oh, no, we, you know, we, uh," or without having to admit that what you were talking about was racism. Because you were talking about space aliens. We don't have any of those here. We don't have that problem. (laughs) You also could put uh, a a black person, an Asian person, a white person, a male, a female, all on the same staff. Right, in space. In space. Oh, yeah. You know? And they could kiss and things like that. Well, it's, again, going back to Star Trek, they just uh, had uh, the first female black admiral. Wow. And guess who her, her heroine was when she was growing up? I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Her, uh, so, I mean, that, that, it, all plays to, it all fits together. Yeah, it sure does. It sure does. So that's where you could break ground, and that's where you could influence young creative people to be writers of – espionage and warfare and things like that. Mm-hmm. So here you are. Well, I got my, I, I was in creative writing class or when I was in uh, seventh grade and I wanted to write science fiction because I'd read so much of it. I could never, I could never come up with a solution to a problem that I created. I had all these, these great plots and then I could never figure out how the heroes <laughs> would get out of them. Yeah. I read so, that you didn't know how to build a story. And that was, yeah, that's that's a very good way to put it. Right, and that's that's one of the things I learned from Tom. Yeah, and you're saying Tom. Let, let's exclude the audience, and you're talking about Tom Clancy, who yeah. uh, uh, you were you what would you call it a collaboration on Red Storm Rising, or would you just say that you were sort of a, a consultant? What would your role be on that? Book? Apprentice was Apprentice. the best way to describe. All right, it. wow. Now, t- Tom Tom had approached me when he was working on Hunt for Red October because he bought a war game that I wrote called Harpoon. Oh. And Harpoon is is modern naval warfare, and there's there's stuff in there that even a lot of of hardcore war gamers wouldn't understand, because it's very you know for that moment advanced technology. We're talking uh, very sophisticated forms of sonar, electronic countermeasures, and I was in the Navy at that point, and I I tried to use very simple terms to describe all that stuff. And Clancy's initial approaches to me were, hey, tell me about ESM, Electronic Support Measures, what is that? How does it work? Right. And I answered those questions for him, and we ended up chatting on the phone a lot, becoming friends. Uh, I read Hunt for October, Red October, while it was still in manuscript form, because he wanted me to look at some of the naval technology. Wow. Yeah. Huge success. I'm, I'm watching Tom go through all of this, and uh, then... He wanted to work with me on a second book. I'm like, shoot, yes. Let me think about it. Yes. And so we plotted it out together, Red Storm Rising. And 
it really started out as a uh, a scenario that was very popular in the 1980s in in military and defense circles. I was working as a defense consultant at that time, and well, not a consultant. I was a worker bee at a consulting firm. I don't want to say I was a consultant myself, just to, to just to clarify the point. But um, in the 1980s, they had this thing called the Central Front Scenario, and the idea was the Russians were going to get about three million armored divisions and come roaring across Germany and the German army and the U.S. forces in Germany were going to stop them, but there was no quest, no, uh, there was no illusion that that would be enough to stop them. The, the idea was that most of the stuff we would be using in Europe was actually still in the U.S. and it had to be sent over to Europe on planes and ships and stuff. And this, this was called, the, they analyzed this a million different ways. And I was talking about this to Tom and he said, that should be a book. I went, really? And that's when I started learning from Tom. And so we plotted it out together, and then I watched him write it. I watched him fix it when it wasn't working right. So there are probably a few words that I could identify in Red Storm Rising that are things that I personally wrote. Right. But they're more often than not modifications or corrections to Tom's text. Because he could, he could crank out, oh, 10 pages a day. And I still can't go that fast unless unless the muse is giving me a really big wet kiss. Wow. Tom was an amazing writer and storyteller. It just came so naturally to him. And, uh, you know, if you're going to learn, learn from the master. That's all I can say. Yeah. That's, After that, I struck out on my own. I can't think of a better person to apprentice under in in the field. Absolutely. That's learning filmmaking from Martin Scorsese, you know? That's, yes. Which I would not mind doing, but Mark has <laughs> been hooked up lately. Yeah. So the other thing too is, yeah, you were an apprentice for uh, for Hunt for Red October, and then you worked with him at Redstone Rising. But those were Tom's first books as well. So he he had a gift. Boy, he had a gift. Oh well, it's it's funny. I mean, new authors approach me and go, "What what should I do?" And I go, "You know, don't do this, don't do that." Tom broke every rule in the book with Hunt for October. First rule is you're supposed to write about something you know so you don't make any huge mistakes. Tom wrote about nuclear submarines and he'd never even been in the military. Coke bottle glasses, he, n nobody wanted him. Although he wanted, he wanted to serve in the worst way. He was a wannabe in the right way. He wanted to serve but it was simply physically impossible for him. So where did he find out about nuclear submarines? Well he had this insurance company in rural Maryland and, you know, Marine Fire and Life. And the guys from the Calvert Cliffs nuclear power plant would come into his office to, to get insurance. Well, the guys running that plant were all ex-nuclear submariners. Mm. And they would start telling sea stories, which any sailor will do if you give them more than half a chance. And Tom absorbed that information about not what they were saying particularly, but the way they talked, their attitudes, their, their mindset. And then he went to books and references, including My Harpoon Game, got a little bit of basic information about nuclear submarines in general and the kind of things they do under the water. Maneuvers, and, et cetera. And all of a sudden he's got, he's got a killer book. But again, he knew nothing to start with. The second rule is when you get an idea, don't write the whole book write a synopsis and then send it in. No, Tom just wrote the whole thing. <laughs> then you're supposed to send it to a publisher who publishes that kind of stuff. If you write a murder mystery, don't send it to somebody who publishes cookbooks. Right. Well, Tom had bought a lot of books from the Naval Institute Press. Now, they're a small outfit up in Maryland that specialize in textbooks for the U.S. Naval Academy, among other things. And they also publish things like Combat Fleets of the World and... U.S. cruiser float planes, very specialized interest group. They never published fiction before Tom's book lands on their editor's desk. And they had just that almost that moment said, gee, you know, we should really publish naval fiction along with nonfiction. Well, wow, that's great timing. So, you know, the, the three biggest rules, he breaks them all and, and wins the lottery. Of course, it doesn't hurt when President Reagan holds your book up on national TV, it says best yarn I've ever read. Boy, yeah, that doesn't that hurt. Was, that doesn't hurt. Oh no, 
Well, let's bring it back to you. So as far as Tom being a rule breaker, that uh, those things certainly apply because his intention was, you know, way out of what anybody would think was normal. But if you think in terms of as a writer, his ability to understand human beings and capture characters, I feel like that's what drove those books. Those books were driven by characters. Sure, it's got a lot of technical stuff in it, and we can get tied up in that stuff and fascinated by it, but the story's still driven by characters. Please. And his ability to understand that. Yeah, his ability to understand that's what what, uh, set him apart from everybody else. And then the second rule that he broke, uh, what was the second rule that he broke? He, uh, well, the second the whole book. rule was right. Oh, he wrote the, the whole, whole book, book. not just a synopsis. Yeah. Well, that rule, I don't feel like there should be rules about the creative process. Uh, it may be more appropriate for, for younger writers, especially, who um, may have a great idea, mm-hmm. but need a lot of help getting that idea to, where, to, to the final destination. Right. A good editor early on in the creative process can really help things. Okay. Uh, Tom obviously was not in need of, of, of help in terms of, of, of writing the story though. He was just a natural gift. Yeah. Uh, How about you? What, what is your, where do you think your gift is in terms of the ability to craft a whole story? Because some people, you know, if you see an artist and they're producing a, a piece of work that's grand, some artists will grid that thing out and, you know, produce a mosaic of small pieces of work that then are, you know, together are a grand piece. Other guys will have a big vision and understand that big vision as a single piece. Where do you fit in? That's an interesting question. Nobody's ever asked me that question quite that way. And my gift is looking at a situation, I think, and being able to break it down and explain it to people and make them under, hopefully make them understand why it's important and make it understandable. For instance, oh my God, there's a ship over the horizon and they've got their missiles locked on us. Why should we feel scared? Right. And I can, I can sort of put that in terms without making it sound like a, uh, like a stereo manual. I have read fiction. You know, I get stuff sent to me all the time where they focus on, you know, the 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 twenty the the two two three caliber bullet left the muzzle of the F sixteen rifle at you know twelve thousand feet per minute and travel the and they get so hung up on the numbers that they don't understand that all that hardware, which is flashy and can be fun, is there for the same reason horses are there in a western, right? So that the right. hero can do his job. Yes, yes. Oh, that's I mean, you, terrific. I mean, I, the point that you made about it being characters, when people come up to me and want to talk about stuff, um, they talk about the characters much, much more than the hardware, unless I've gotten something wrong. And then they talk to me about that. <laughs> you know, but, For instance, uh, when I did um, Enemy Within with Pat Larkin, this was back in the 80s, and it was one of the first times I tackled a female character. And... She, you know, there was a Helen Gray and Peter Thorne. Now, Peter was your typical Delta Force colonel. Delta Force wouldn't talk to me at all, by the way. I got no help from the Delta Force PAO. His favorite word was, no, I can't do that. The, but Aaron, Helen was the first female head of the uh, FBI's hostage rescue team. And I had a lot of fun with their romantic relationship because Peter kept on trying to relate to her as, you know, me warrior, you woman, that wasn't working for him. Right. And, and <laughs> she, you know, it, it wasn't until he could relate to her as a full equal that she started to pay attention to him. And shortly after that, I was invited down to Richmond to a book convention festival that was organized for charity. And there were all these gals who put this thing together and you could have, Stamp them all out of out of a, a machine that built beautiful thirty something, immensely intelligent, overqualified women. 
Okay, these, these, these women all had careers and families and found time to do all this very useful charity work, and they were all gorgeous. I, I want that well, machine, this is by not the a way. Bad place to hang out. I'm, and yeah. they all came up to me and said how much they liked Helen Gray. All right. Like, yes. Yes. I connected with a female you audience. Connected. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, the person that I think captures those details about the bullet leaving the muzzle and all that stuff well, but doesn't overdo it, is Ron Howard. He'll take and he'll capture what the engine does in in uh, Driven, or he he'll uh, he'll highlight a mechanical aspect in Apollo thirteen or or the fire, you know, in in Backdraft. He just takes the element, just shows you what it does, but doesn't dwell on it. The film has that that aspect that you could put a thousand words of of of, of description into just a few moments. And, and and really convey the detail. Uh, yeah, Howard does that beautifully. I mean, Apollo it, 13, you know, and, and he made it, well, it's like a... It goes back to your point, though. It's not about the mechanical thing. It's about right. why we should be scared. It's yeah, about I mean, why we should be excited. guys locked in this capsule yeah. trying to stay alive. Right, and the mechanical things that that he chose to depict you know, underscored the complications of the job so we mm-hmm. could get to where these guys were thinking and underscored the delicate nature of whatever it is. I mean, whether it's Driven or Apollo 13, there's a delicate nature in there that makes somebody have to be so critically minded that they have to put their fear aside in order to get out of whatever enormous jam they've gotten themselves in. And now we're emotionally invested in, well, what's he going to do now? Right. Howard used a, a technique in that movie that I, I, we use ourselves sometimes in that he got, there was a lot of technical talk and, and detail early on when they're in the simulator, when they're talking about right. different, different flight conditions and stuff like that. But once the action starts, once they're in danger, mm-hmm. all that technical detail has been explained to the audience. Yes. Assuming they didn't sleep through the first half of the movie, they now understand the depth and the background behind the character's decisions. Yeah, you and set we'll the table. And we'll sometimes do the same thing in the book. Uh, we'll have a uh, a chapter where they're in training or they're dealing with some technical issue where they can sort of explain what's going on to the reader in a non-urgent, non-time-sensitive kind of situation. Yeah, you and make it sound time cool out. and fun. Right. And then once the shooting starts, all that's already, you know, the reader's been brought up to speed. Tom Clancy's books were like that, too. You had you had to invest 150 pages into getting started because he had multiple scenes to establish. He had to teach you about special operations or, or European financing and all these different things he had to cover. And you had to pay the bill a little bit. But once you got past that hump, you couldn't put the book down. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what that's what Act One, Act Two, and Act Three are all about. Act One is you set up the characters. Act Two is you start mixing stuff up, and it, you can't have the hero understand completely what's going on until the beginning of Act Three. If you like the show, and you know you do, send us some pictures and movies. Don't do that. Support the show. There are three ways you can support us. Number one. Go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts and leave a five-star rating and review. It helps with the show metrics and helps us get better placement. Number two, visit our website, www.breakitdownshow.com. We've got an Amazon and an eBay link. Same Amazon, same eBay, you know and love, but they give us a little kickback when you get to their site from ours. And number three, leave comments about the shows that you like. We want to know what you think, how you feel. Tell us how to make the show better. We greatly appreciate it. Now back to the show. We like boobies. So those things never change. Those are really the rules in terms of, you know, when you mention the rules, the things that you never do, you never send your book to a publisher who blah, blah, blah. Really, let's talk about what moves human beings so that we can so that we can be entertained by your work. And then you can do whatever you want with the publisher. That's After that, there are no rules. So how are you doing in that regard in terms of being as much as you've... I mean, what do you have, 40 published works? Well, you've been around well, a long time. Well, I, I, have, I quit my day job in 1986. I've been peddling like Jeez. crazy ever since. 
<laughs> and and it's I've got I did five books with Pat Larkin. I've done eight books with Jim DeFelice, two book, four book series. I've done four, five books with Chris Carlson, with another one in the the Hopper, and we're halfway through the next one. And then in addition, I've got all the the, the published stuff on War Games. And this picture behind me, you're seeing, that's all my stuff. Yeah. Shelf. Golly, that's a hell and of a bookshelf. Is, those are the games that I've published over the years since April of 1980. And I'm not going to stop doing the games because the games is how Tom Clancy found me. Right. And also, there's a lot of crossover. For instance, um, the third book in the Jerry Mitchell series is called Exit Plan. And the Jerry Mitchell series basically think of uh, Horatio Hornblower but nuclear submarines. The guy is is a, is a uh, junior officer on the first book. He's a department head in the second book. By the third book, he's executive officer. Now, he's already we've already shown in the first two books that he is tremendously capable and knows submarines backwards and forwards. Well, let's take him outside his comfort zone and strand him on an Iranian beach with uh, a team of SEALs and two people that they were supposed to be rescuing. And it's the classic, you call this a rescue? Uh, <laughs> right. And it, again, we, we took real world things that were going on. For instance, there is uh, a U.S. Navy submarine called a swimmer delivery vehicle, which the Navy built. And the idea was it was a mini sub that would dock on the, uh, on the back of a sub. The sub could carry it to someplace, and then the swimmer delivery vehicle could motor in to very, very shallow water. And launch divers or pick people up, this kind of thing. And the technology is fairly straightforward, but the Navy tried to get fancy with the batteries. They used lithium batteries, which are very have a very high power density, but this these this particular lithium battery caught fire a lot. Oh boy. They're still trying to figure that one out, but we had basically a battery fire happen in the book. And the thing sinks and they're on the beach. And then Jerry has to spend the rest of the the thing getting out. So we were researching the Iranian nuclear program. We were researching uh, just the geography of Iran. Uh, the Israelis got involved. Now, at the same time, we wrote a book or a, a game based on that information called Persian Incursion. And it was a discussion of what is still a very uh, important topic in the Middle East is the Iranian nuclear program. And what happens if the Israelis decide to go after it? Uh, Do you mean when? Well, that's 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 the issue. Right. We didn't take a judgment on whether they should or not. Uh -huh. I mean, um, you know, the Israelis have shown more than enough willingness to go after uh, people when they feel that they've got a nuclear program going on. They've done it with uh, Iraq in 1980. They did it with uh, uh, Syria. Uh, just just a few years ago, I'm trying to remember the exact date, but they will act unilaterally anytime they feel the security is, is appropriately threatened. So we felt we had justification for putting stuff like that in the book. Sure, you do absolutely. Uh, so, but the game simply said, if they do, what happens politically and militarily in the in the region? And so you have cards that you play with different political actions on it, like. Uh, uh, speech to the UN or or black ops and the Iranian is massing political points that they could spend to, to get get allies the Iranians are doing the Israelis are doing the same thing other non-player countries but ones that have interest in the area can participate as as supporters or or opponents um, it, it's very complex that sounds At, like it and uh, the idea is we it, it used the same research we found when we were working on the book. So I, I worked a lot in Iraq, and I worked right by the Tuatha uh, plant that the Israelis blew up. And here's how good the Israelis are at this stuff. And I don't know if this stuff gets figured into your game because it adds a layer of complexity. But every, every Iraqi I talked to out there said the Iranians did that. 
I'm sorry, say that again? Exactly right. Every Iraqi I talked to said that the Iranians blew up their nuclear power plant. Every I single thought, one. I thought I heard you right. Yeah, you, you did. Yeah, <laughs> I saw you sit there with your mouth open saying, wait a second, what? That's how good the Israelis are. They got all of the people, I mean, thousands of people there must believe that the Iranians did that. Well, they've got, we had a, we had a, Couple things that we talked about in the book, for instance, the reputation that Mossad has for for being able to mess with people's minds. <laughs> like the perfect yes. example thereof. I had not heard that one. I mean, my, my court. But uh, yeah, these these bottom line militarily, the Israelis can go over and and blow up anything they want to in Iran anytime they want to. The Iranian right. air defense system is a lash up of, of systems from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And even if the Russians do sell the Iranians those brand new S 400s or S 300 PMUs, whatever it is, uh, it, it, it'll only be this isolated hard bubble in this one spot. The rest of the country will be wide open. And uh, by the way, there's a very common misconception. Oh. The only thing in Iran that is that is hardened. The only target that you need special hard target bombs for is uh, well. There's two sites. There's Fodor, which is near Tehran, and Natanz, which is in the south. Both of those have the the centrifuges that spin and, and enrich uranium. And the real center of the Iranian nuclear program is actually at a place called Esfahan. And if you look at Google Earth photos of Esfahan, which I have frequently, uh, those buildings are all in the open. They're hmm. they aren't even heavy construction. They almost look like a like a light industri- light industry, like prefab warehouse style buildings. Yeah, kind of prefab warehouse style. I think they threw it up in a hurry because they were trying to get this thing started. But we're, enrichment is only one part of the fuel cycle and the bomb cycle. The Esfahan, that's where they refine and 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 forge uh, exotic metals like uranium. They have forges there that the work was chromium and other things. They do a lot of their missile work there. So that's where the bomb would actually get built if there was going to be a bomb. That's where they create the uranium hexafluoride gas and the yellow cake. Well, no, the LK comes in there. But that's where they create the, the hexafluoride gas that goes to the enrichment plant. That, so those, those two facilities are side by side. And there's a third one there, which is where they take the hexafluoride gas and turn it back into metallic uranium. You bomb Esfahan and... No bomb. No bomb, no bomb. for them. Yeah. And so... But yet the, 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 the Iranians have concentrated, you know, the... the, uh, the uh, Natanz has like 10 batteries of, of 100 millimeter guns and six SAM batteries. It's like, dude, you're protecting the wrong thing. You know that, don't you? <laughs> but that's why that's why what you do is so incredible. I mean, you're able to take that process and expose, you know, here's here's the link. You don't have to blow the whole process up. You just need to blow up step seven, you know, and uh, and there it is. And, and that that makes defending your stuff well, exponentially harder because there's always someone that will figure out the whole. Like a, a when I commute on BART in the mornings, there's all this stuff about internet security and and is your internet protected and is your network this? Is your, yeah, it is. And I always think yes, but all I need is a hot chick and a little bit of booze, <laughs> and I can get any <laughs> password I want. You know? Yes, yes. There's a the, the uh, I. Th- I I haven't played around much with internet security, but I've often heard that employees are the best are the best gateway into the system. Absolutely, yeah. I can't get through your machine, but I got a set of titties and a cocktail, and I'm in. It's all it's all that matters. I'm sorry, I just imagined Pete with a set of titties. Um, the uh, <laughs> very disturbing. Thank you for sharing visual. that image. Yeah. <laughs> so. Getting back to the human element of creating stories, that is yep. more fascinating to me, just hearing that arm of espionage. 
is more fascinating to me than, you know, the bullet leaving the muzzle, all that stuff. And I'm fascinated by that stuff. I dug, I dig that stuff. But as soon as you insert the, we're going to bring some girls and we're going to get some guys drunk and we're going to get their passwords that way. Yeah. You know, that wakes up a whole different excitement about the plot. You're going to have to do some research on that, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Heavy price well, to pay. I don't pay. know. My wife's Italian. I go around research, researching hot women and drinks. I could, you know, lose vital parts of my anatomy. It, it you, could, you could, could always, bad. you could always hire a guy I know that looks exactly like me. I, uh, I can go to the Spearmint Rhino and do some, uh, some control group testing <laughs> well, for so you. You volunteer for research, huh? Field not, work, not, not volunteer, not volunteer. Field work, <laughs> yeah, field, field work for sure. So what? What do you want to talk about that you're doing next that you'd like us to get excited about and get our listeners excited about? Well, I, what the, the, the great frontier for us right now is self-publishing. Uh, we're working on a, a novel, which is not going to go through the traditional publishing process. All right. We're going to self-publish, which is what a lot of authors are getting into these days. Yeah. And I've got a great relationship with my publisher, and I'm still in a contract with him to do another book with him. So that's, you know, fine. And, and, but what happens when instead of charging, what do they want now for a hardcover? 25 bucks. Oh my God. I was going to say bucks. 30 bucks. Yeah. yeah. And even when you get in a soft cover, it's seven or eight or nine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I get a portion of that. Uh, you know my, the contract, and and the publisher I work with is is a very good guy about about paying on time, so I can't complain. But what if you could get that same book for six ninety five, right? And the outfit that runs the server takes their fifteen percent off the top, and I get the rest. Yeah, you have to move a lot a lot fewer books. The other thing that happens is, let's say you use Amazon as your self publishing platform. They're incented to report every book you sell. Yeah, the incentive is is different because of the way that the mechanics work. They they want the publishing mechanism to to look good, and their way of doing that is to show that you're moving units. So, you know, their incentive to bury your volume in smoke and mirrors so they can pay you less is is diminished greatly. We've had an author on Chris Guillory who wrote his first book and self published it, and the process for him, as he described it, was great because he got some tools that were available through the self-publishing method, things like authors and fact checkers and things like that. But I think if you are self-publishing, the great thing that you do for authors out there is that you are supporting the new infrastructure, which has a lot less parts in the middle. A lot fewer hands digging into the pile. And we love to see the artist and the author, the creator, make more money. Well, it's, it's, I'm all in favor of the making more money part. I, I'm a big fan of self publishing. It's, it's removed one of the biggest obstacles between new authors and getting the first book out there. I mean, traditional publishers operated as gatekeepers. Right. They made sure that, you know, it was their money that was being risked to manufacture the physical objects, the right. books. Yep. So they they would make sure that it was a quality product. At the same time, that that book had to fit whatever preconceptions, prejudices, or marketing strategies the publisher had. Now, both of those filters are gone. Yep. So, yeah, you can get a guy out there who's written a book that might not find a happy publisher but you've also removed the filter on quality and yes it is is i mean my my publisher god bless him has this standard 15 minute spiel that he goes into whenever anybody starts talking about self-publishing and and i'll boil it down to about a minute and a half here but basically he's saying that he published him publishing a book is the same as as a baker making bread he has to make it he has to store it. He has to ship it, and he has to to um, take the stale bread back, which publishers also do. Oh, and by the way, he can't sell the same bread every every week. He's got to come up with new bread all the time because once they've eaten that kind of bread, they're not going to they're not going to want it anymore. And ninety five percent of what he does really has nothing at all to do 
with a creative process or writing. Yep. It has to do with baking the bread, moving the bread, all these other things. Storage and transport. And you take that away. Take that 95% away and throw in the trash. It's not there. All that infrastructure, all those employees, all those management issues go away. What are you left with? You can have the world's biggest publisher consist of an office with a server. Yep. And that's that's scary. And what you're left with is an author and a consumer. And that's great on the one hand, but like you said, you also take the quality filters away. And one of the Have things- you guys read a lot of fan fiction? No. Okay. There's a I tripped over it when somebody sent me some fan fiction and said, Hey, here's this fan fiction thing I wrote. Tell me whether it's any good. It was for a friend, so I read it and I made a couple of comments. But he said, hey, I'm going to post it on this site. So I went over and looked at the site. I had no idea. Volumes um, and volumes of fan fiction. Well, I mean, you, you get people who love Buffy, Babylon 5, Castle, mm-hmm. or Law and & Order. And the show ends and the, the, the last commercial runs and the, the show signs off. And they don't want the story to end. So they will write more stories. Yeah. And you can get anything. Um uh, uh, and there are forums for different types, obviously categorized by genre and then by, by show within genre. And it's perfectly okay to write a, a uh, Law & Order episode using the same stars, saying your own words, as long as you're not making any money off of it. And yep. it's for your personal pleasure and whoever wants to read the story. And I look at fan fiction which is absolutely no filters. And I go, this is sort of what the market may be moving to. Huh. Be- because you're going to get people who say, I want to write a story about whatever. And they can go to a publisher who really just takes it and maybe he checks for typos, maybe he doesn't, puts it up on the web. And people that, that like it pay money. Now, there you won't be able to violate copyrights, but... If you want to have a uh, murder mystery set on Mars between between bugs, you know that's that's well, actually that one might sell. I should write that idea down. <laughs> yeah, no but, kidding. <laughs> You're welcome. The idea is that 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 it's. I think the market for fiction and and stuff. I mean the the, the I should, should say the market. The available fiction will grow. There'll be more stories out there. And people will tend to look more for what they're reading now or things similar to what they're reading now. So you're going to have a little bit more narrow niches. And there will be no filters. You're really going to have to pay attention to the quality of what you're writing. It's really just what you're you're reading. Right. It's a way to make the spec script available to the, to the, uh, you know, film fan. Well, it's when I talk to English classes, which I, I do periodically, um, and I tell them, yeah, you want to go out, you want to write, and I encourage you to write, you know, because then you can go back to your own story and recognize whether or not it's any good. You know, the first story that you write, you all you always think you're brilliant, and then until you go and read something else, and you go, okay, maybe this is needs a little work. <laughs> I um, I saw a uh, an interview with Joe Carnahan and. He mentioned mm. that actually Joe Carnahan was on uh, our friend Mick Betancourt's show, and he said that people ask him all the time, "Hey man, I wrote a script. Do you want to read it?" And he always says, "No," and I don't want to be an <laughs> ass about it, but I don't want to read your script. I want to read your tenth script because you've worked all that shit out. And then now on number ten, you can go, "All right, now you've polished a little bit and you've gotten over a couple of the hiccups," and and so here you are. Let me throw this stat at you that's related. We now create the same amount of content that existed from the dawn of humanity to 1974 every two weeks. Oh, my gosh. Every two weeks. So yeah, that is extraordinary, and I have absolutely no trouble believing it. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's an incredible thing. You know, you talk about the barrier, too, that the publisher used to create. There's still the barrier of the process of writing. And I know you talked about how Tom Clancy could sit down and bang out 10 pages of text. That's not common. 
you know, and you talked. Uh, no, it's not. I read somewhere for you, like you've got a, a certain number of words. You do your math, you backwards plan it out. You know, you've got to type 580 words a day or whatever that is. Do you yeah. mind sharing? What is that number that you need to do commonly to get a book out by a deadline? Well, it, it, I try and crank, you know, I'm on a one year schedule. And so if I do 1500 words a day, I, I know I'm going to finish in time. Now, if you actually look at the length of a, of a novel, it's what 150,000 words. So theoretically, I could get it done in 100 days, but that's 100 business days because there are things to do on the weekend, and it's not every day that I, I do 1,500 words. But if I can get 1,500 words out the door, then I've done a good day's work. Now there are authors who do a lot more, and also I've usually got two or three different projects going on at the same time. I mean, in addition to writing the book that I'm writing right now, uh, we're also working on a whole new set of, of war game rules, and I'm also in the process of con converting some legacy war game titles to digital content because we're selling a bunch of stuff on the web now. So uh, multiple projects at any time, given time, and I don't think I'm unusual in that. Uh, here's one other statistic I'll give for you, though. Um, when I wrote Red Phoenix back in 1980, whatever it was, we sold 225,000 in hardcover. That was a great number back then. The publisher was delighted and immediately signed me up for two more books. Happy, happy, joy, joy. The latest one that we had on the New York Times bestseller list didn't make it to number 10, neither did Red Phoenix. But about the same spot, sold 70,000 in hardcover. Wow. And the publisher was just as delighted and signed me up for another two books. That's incredible. So is 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 and, and this is all because I'm 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 still thinking about the ebook thing. Are we selling that many more ebooks? Or are people playing Angry Birds and Candy Crush instead of reading? I think it's both. I think that the people yeah. that buy books are gonna to continue to buy books, but there are more distractions and there's a whole lot more ebooks out there for sure. And 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 media in general. I mean, you can now find out about a TV series that was on two years ago and go and binge watch it. Right. And that's a whole that didn't that didn't exist when we grew up. Right. You're talking about consuming a team's work that they produced over the course of a year in a rainy weekend. Yeah. The other thing too about the 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 newer media is that that draw people like Candy Crush that kind of thing. Also, you have our format, the podcast, which is really replacing a lot of of the shorter literary works. A white paper can be done in an hour, hour and a half conversation or a series of conversations, and it's so much more consumable. You're you're absolutely right. I just, in fact, I just heard yesterday when we were we were at a gathering, and somebody says, "Oh, you've got to go and see this. It's really great." And it's a podcast, and it's actually it's actually a series. It'll take about three hours to go through it all. So I'm I'm media, entertainment, information. How is that different than a book? Well, it's not on paper, but it's still there. And I would even say that in a book, you're limited. You're 1,500 words. I don't know how many of those survive all the way to the final cut. <laughs> Right. I read, I read a book about three times. Right. Yeah. And we can explain something, but we also can take that pause and, and go on an aside or, you know, spoken word is, is a different way of communicating it in a lot of ways. It's, it's a more efficient way because I can use inflection. I can, I can pick whatever word I want. I'm not bound by the paper and a number, a word count. You also take away creative inflection from the reader because sometimes the reader has a certain amount of control over the journey that you take them on based on how they want to read it. And there's some I, magic in that. Oh, I, I totally agree with that. The best example that I've got for that is, uh, is Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Michael Crichton, we had the same agent for a while. That was kind of cool. And I, I never met Michael Crichton, but I thought, cool. Well, you guys and, were playing on the same team. Yeah. He's one of the few authors that I know who can up, he's got a foot in each world. He could write the book and then write the screenplay. Yeah, and of that's course he had the power to make sure that it was written as a, uh, you know, it, it was filmed the way that he wrote it. Yeah, right. So it Jurassic Park, I read the book as soon as it came out. And 
if you read the book, it's very violent, very gory. But because it's a book, you got the ability to dial your information down. I noticed when he made the movie, it was much less violent. He dialed it down for us. Because, you know, he knew it would be in our faces. Right. He also made some other changes that I thought were interesting. The 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 role of the of the 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 chaos scientist mm -hmm. and Jeff Goldblum's character was played differently. And the and Richard Attenborough's role was 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 different than the book as well. So but yet, still, that's what Mike Crichton wanted to do. So, I, I liked uh, how Jeff Goldblum interpreted that character. I like what he did there. I don't always like what Jeff Goldblum does because he kind of does the same thing. But if you want that in your movie, I think he did it great. And in, uh, in that in that particular sense, it was wonderful. Yes, but it was a lot less interpretable. As a consumer, you got what you got there. That's and like true. you said, if you're interested in going for a ride where you have some degree of control over the character, and when you have some degree over the control of the character, you can you know, potentially get more emotionally invested in it. So there's a lot that has to get cooked down when you do things like put a white paper on a podcast or, or put a you know, book into a film. Absolutely. Sometimes to the detriment of the piece of work. Sometimes. Sometimes. But if it gets if it gets consumed more, you've got that balance. Yeah. You know, if I can read a white I can't read a white paper when I drive or when I ride on the uh, public transit or when I'm flying over I don't read well when I fly cuz I just get too distracted by the things, but I'll listen to something or watch something a lot more frequently. So I have been surprised by how many people uh pick up the audio versions of my books. Who reads no. the audio versions of your books? Who voices them? Uh, we actually get to, we actually get to choose. All right. They sent me for the latest book three voice samples. Now the technology certainly helps. Um, and they said, "Which one of these guys do you want to read your book?" And I'm, I'm loving it. I wish I could remember the name of the gentleman we picked. That's terrific. Yeah. Oh, it's it's wonderful. Um, uh, they use. Um, no name, no name actors that I'm familiar with, but uh, a lot of fellows who've had done work on Broadway. Really? Okay, so they so have the dramatic inflection, and they have yeah. all of the skills, all of the all the chops, uh, but you don't have to pay for the big name. Yeah. Well, terrific. Hey, oh, we, we appreciate are. you letting us take up an hour of your life. But two things about that: we could go on like this for easy, much much longer. But we do have an appointment behind you. And when we ask you again, hey, Larry, let's you got a new piece of workout. Let's get together and let's do another podcast. We don't want you to think, golly, those guys, man, they promised to do an hour and they, they had me all the way through lunchtime. <laughs> so uh, thank you for coming on, though. Oh, yeah. Peter, yeah, Peter John, it's, it's, it's been fun. And, you know, it's it's uh, talking about the business of writing instead of actually doing it is kind of refreshing in a way. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> yes. You know, your perspective does help, though. And like, you know, the question of what I need to do, that's one thing. But for you to say, I break down my day into 1500 word segments, and then I go work on another project, and, you know, there's so much detail in there that that fills in the blanks for people it gives them an idea how they might do it. And it's hard to know those things without having a conversation like this. Oh, it's it's a uh, it's it's an interesting i mean i don't get to go into an office and sit there i mean i don't complain because i don't have to commute i live near washington dc yeah. and not commuting is one of the great joys of being a writer wow but uh Especially I'm by myself, in washington dc I traffic i don't get the collaborative vibe that other people get yeah you definitely are a collaborator and we really didn't get to talk about jim d felice very much but he's been on the show and, and we're big fans of all of jim's work Jim is is an amazingly good writer and took my that's why I collaborate because he took the story in directions I never would have thought of going and it was a real stretch which is always good for a writer wow well you know what let's table that for our topic of conversation next time I really want to explore why writers should collaborate that might be a show where we have Jim on and Larry on at the same time too because Jim's equally a fan of collaboration well that's true no, I would love to do that. Anytime I can be in the same room, even electronically with Jim, it's always a good time. <laughs> Terrific. Hey, thanks a lot. Hey, anytime, guys. Anytime.